Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, a family podcast of pirates and penguins. We're a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston. Join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. And this time we're recording. This is take two. (laughs) Take two. Uh, You hear that a lot. For some reason, my recording software, the start recording button has stopped working. So I have to remember to look at the thing and make sure the numbers are clicking over. Anyway, what you missed from the first time we did this, uh, which was only like a minute and a half or something like that. So thankfully, I, I saw it early. If it had been any longer, we probably would have just thrown in the towel and said Merry Christmas Eve after the New Year. But in any case, you, you are hearing this now. And what we are hearing is, is we're talking about penguins of our pirates and penguins is most appropriate this time this week, because if you're not from the northeast of any sort or at least in seaboard, uh, we got snow. Lots. Lots of snow, uh, as we've established, about, what, 13, 14 inches, which and, is a lot for the Boston area in December. And, and I'm surprised because when we got our surprise pre-Halloween snowstorm, I figured that we were probably just, like, done for the entire year. Yeah. It, I mean, last year, basically, we got a little bit of snow in December, and then that was it. Like, yeah. we didn't get any in January, February. I didn't use the snowblower at all last year. Yeah, like you'd say, it just sat there all year, which which was logical because I'd spent one hundred and fifty dollars to get it tuned up and fixed and ready to go for the season. You know, and so that's obviously the the going to be the time when it doesn't need to be used. Uh, but uh, yeah, and it doesn't exactly work like you know you get snow in December and uh, in October and it like sucks up the snow budget for the year. Sometimes it feels like that, though. <laughs> I know, I know. We, there's patterns in the world, and we want to see patterns. Uh, but in this case, uh, we got a. I think people think like New England. Oh, it must snow there. Winter is snowy. That's what I thought before I moved here. That's Vermont, <laughs> yeah, and New Hampshire and Maine, and actually, like Western Mass. I moved to the wrong part. I moved of New to the England. wrong part of, of, of yes. Typical Texan moved to the wrong part. Right. Yeah. So yeah. just like a New Englander who moved to Texas and moved to the wrong part. Yeah, know? pretty much. <laughs> I don't know what the wrong part of Texas is, but uh, I'm sure there is one. If you're a New Englander <laughs> trying to go to Texas, where you think is like red state Texas, oh. going to like Austin would probably be the wrong part. Or going to Waco. That's pretty much just the wrong part. No, everybody wants to go to Waco. No, I'm. I, that's the, oh, why. I the, like the whole Wh- Magnolia. Like, like, like. Everyone thinks it's some of your family members announced upper. amounts to me that they wanted to go move to Waco. And I'm looking at them like nobody wants to move to Waco. <laughs> Why? Waco, is, Waco don't want to be in Waco. W- Waco is like, OK, so I my one of my best friends went to grad school at Baylor. Yes. And spent just about every single weekend crashing on our couch in uh, Dallas because Waco is boring. And like he had we, we got like season tickets to the opera together because Waco is boring and Dallas is fun. So my, my impression of Waco is like, it's the boring place that you want to escape to <laughs> escape from when you're a grad student there because it's yeah. boring. <laughs> well, apparently it's not as boring. Is it still a dry town? I don't know. Cause it was as, as far as I re- recall, as you telling me it was a dry town. Like there's no, you can't get alcohol. It's a Baptist wonderland. Yeah. Cause of Baylor. Because of Baylor. Uh, so I think all these Catholic New Englanders moving there would have a nasty which, surprise. Which is, which is probably one of the reasons why this particular friend found it so incredibly boring. But we'll, <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Well, here, people have this impression that New England, it's like the Boston area, it snows and it's snowy all, so- all winter. But that is not true. In fact, uh, it's rare that we get snow in December. Yeah. Uh, it's we Or, no, we get snow. It's rare that we get like a substantial snow. amount of snow. And it's rare as hen's teeth that we have snow on the ground at Christmas. Yeah. We rarely have a white Christmas. And we might not have one this year because there's a storm coming in this week, a rain storm, which could wash away a lot of the snow. I, my, my bet is we're going to not, it's all going to melt by Christmas and we're just going to have another gray, bleak, 
Brady and Christmas. Oh, even even better. It's going to be like the half melted, like gray snow mounds. Right, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. In mud. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I'll have a gray Christmas. It'll be the perfect 2020 Christmas. Uh, it could surprise us. It could surprise us, though, because we did have that one year with the magical Christmas Eve uh, snow. That was really nice. It was not a lot of snow. It was like a dusting, but it, right. But it was snowing as we got out of Midnight Mass, and that and it was, was just unexpected mag- magic. Yes, and it was only snowing apparently at church and at home, and nowhere in between. Yeah, that was kind of weird. It was kind of weird. That's why it's the magical Christmas snow. So somebody was praying hard. Yes, one of the littles. Uh, so we had a, a 14 inches of snow, had the snow blower. It was wet, heavy, as they call it around here, heart attack snow. It's the kind where guys are dropping in the snow because they're trying to shovel it. And, uh, I was trying to take it easy with the snow blower, but it was, it was struggling. Uh, I did have help of a sort. Help. <laughs> they were out there shoveling, uh, mostly helping. Um, sometimes they get a little distracted, but, uh, but yeah, the part of the problem is, is I know how to do it. I've been doing it for nigh on 40 years, shoveling snow. And so I kind of get the idea of like, this is how to get, make sure you get, and they don't, and they don't do it systematically and they kind of just flail at it in different directions. And you're not out there telling them how to do it. Well, I'm either out there with the snow blower so they can't hear me or I'm inside recovering and then they go out when I'm inside or I'm inside working. So, yeah, they, but they, they, they need, they need some more direction. Right. So actually when we got home yesterday, we, when we went out, uh, I, I, we needed to clear the spot where the van was because the, all the snow that piles around it, especially the snow, you pull off the top. I have to, the, the problem with the van is it's so tall. I need a ladder to clear the top off. That's, that was an unexpected thing. That's that something you don't think about in May when you're buying the vehicle is having to clear the snow off of it. But that's just one of those things. And uh, so we had to clear all the snow off the driveway. So we were out, I was out there with them showing them, okay, here, just, just don't sh- like scoop, carry, and dump. Push. Just push. push. Yeah, so there's a lot of those little tricks. Anyway, so we did the, a lot of the shoveling. Uh, one of the things I have, to, I have to say, I look at my neighbor's driveways, and I kind of get envious because they get the, down to the pavement. They clear the snow. And our pa- our driveway is like it always has like a half an inch of snow on it, and like because the snowblower can't, it's it's not one of those big, powerful, expensive snowblowers. It's the one we could afford, and so it doesn't do quite the job that I wanted to do. But that's a New England guy thing, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so. kind of like like lawn envy. Grass is always greener. Yes, yes. The snow is always more clear. It's but fun. the nice thing is, is it's the last few days since the snowstorm has been beautiful. It's really nice because. It has, it's been cold, so it hasn't all melted off the trees. So the trees are all limbed and, and snow still. And you, you can really see the birds. Yeah. You and Belle have been going crazy for the birds. Yeah, we've seen lots of birds. Wrens, cardinals, uh, starlings. And the mockingbird. We've, we've been hearing him all summer, but he, he usually doesn't hang out in our yard. But he has discovered that we have... Uh, rose hips on the wild rose bush mm-hmm. and uh he was chasing the other birds away from it <laughs> the nice thing is like cardinals really obviously stand out in, in the snow cardinals in the snow are like magic yeah they're they're, magic they're, they're there all the time you just don't see them well you do but not not as dramatically it's they're dramatic yes so that's like, their picture nice. their picture postcard dramatic yeah when it's got you got snow on the ground yep so that's been nice uh, so I mentioned we went out uh, yesterday, Saturday, uh, because it was time to get the tree. We are we are among the late tree getters. Yes. We usually wait until the third or fourth Sunday of Advent. Sometimes we get the th- we do the third Sunday when Christmas is like a couple days after. Like when Christmas is at the end of the four, like if there's four or five days like it is this year. That's like a, almost a full week of the fourth week of Advent. Right. Like what was it? Was it last year or the year before? It was recently. Like Chris, it was fourth fourth Sunday of Advent, and the next day was Christmas. Right, I forget. That had to in be in which case, you, you got you get you get your tree early. We got a tree like the third week of uh, the third Sunday of Advent. So we usually wait till the third or fourth Sunday. In the past, we've gone to Home Depot. I mean, that sounds kind of like lame and prosaic, but we usually are there getting like other lights and you know because I don't know what it is, but over the summer 
light the lights burn out in the box i don't know why but they they tend to and but this year we decided to go local yes there's a uh a local landscaping company that we i've used for when we built our garden boxes and they're they're new management new ownership and so we decided to go by there one of the things we noticed is that everybody's selling out of christmas trees early i was a little worried we might not get a tree my my mom was saying that that was true in uh in Austin as well, and my my dad had done some quick quick and dirty internet research, and evidently, like it takes ten years to grow a Christmas tree, and about ten years ago there was a recession, and so they weren't planting as many trees. They didn't have the resources to plant them, right? Because they, I, I'm going to assume they weren't thinking in ten years we're still going to be in recession. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, this in is ten my... years there'll be a pandemic and nobody will want a tree. <laughs> Either that, or it's because be resources, it's, or, or because it's pandemic. Like everybody's buying trees who doesn't usually buy them. I, I, I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, people would be more like, I don't want the fake tree this year. I want the real tree. And maybe the lots aren't buying as many because they didn't think that people would want as many. I don't know. It's, it'd be an interesting question for some enterprising reporter to go, fig, you know, report on. Why is there a shortage of Christmas trees? Yes, that would be a nice thing for a reporter to do. Something interesting that isn't about all the other baloney. But uh, all the lots, I can, all of our local lots, I kept seeing them shutting down early. The the one down at Stanny's, the uh, in front of the, the 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 breakfast restaurant shop, that that shut down early. And when we went in to buy ours at JMF, the guy was saying, "Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have been coming by saying that they've they've sold out in their town. They they had to come by here. So to let people know, we've got a few left. And they, I mean, really, there's only about a dozen left, maybe two dozen. Yeah, it they didn't have a lot. So." <laughs> <laughs> but we got the prettiest tree on the lot. It is the best tree we've had in years. Ben, Ben spotted it. Yes, he did spot it. I mean, a lot of the they had a lot of nice trees, and frankly, that makes me say because we bought a tree from that same lot with all of the different owners years ago, and but we've been getting Home Depot ever since. I, I think we need to keep going <laughs> to these guys and getting our tree there. It's a little more expensive. Yeah, we paid a little more than than we did at Home Depot. But yeah, this is a nice tree. It's not a Charlie Brown tree. I know you like Charlie Brown trees. I do like Charlie Brown trees. I do. This is a nice conical. It's like a cone shaped. It's exactly what you think of a Christmas tree to look like. It's yeah. It doesn't have big gaps. Uh, it was a little tall. I had to cut it down a little to make it fit. I almost knocked it over trying to get the star on it. <laughs> yes, that was. Mama, you're knocking over the tree. It's tipping. That was exciting. And uh, yeah, I. I should have brought, I should have, we have two different tree stands and I, we bought a smaller one a couple of years ago because we've been getting smaller trees and the big, the big one, the tree skirt doesn't fit around it. But I think this one, this tree is big enough that it might've needed the big tree, the big tree stand. Anyway, we'll, we'll hear a crash in the middle of the night and that'll be that. <laughs> I might have to tie it to the wall. Uh, That's so classy. Yes. Well, I'll use invisible fishing line in any case. Um, the uh tree is up i love decorating the christmas tree i it's so fun with the kids because like there's all the you know ornaments that have memories and we have to tell the stories and yes you know so and so gave us this ornament we got this ornament the year you were born like like for a long time some of your relatives were giving us like every year that a kid was born they would give us a rel a, a ornament. my mom that's my mom a mom thing to do and that was like one of your sisters-in-law. No, I'm pretty sure it's my mom. I okay, I mean, maybe you remember better, but my that's a that's totally something my mom does. But maybe it was one of my sisters. It wasn't Carol. I thought it was Carol. Could it be Carol? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, Carol is thoughtful that way too, so could be. Anyway, in any case, we, we have we have a bunch of random ornaments with like sn snowmen. 2006, 2007. They kind of peters out around 2008 to 9 11, something like that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, I think we have one for at least each each year that a child was born. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. 2013. Yeah. Um, so there's a 2011, there's a 2013. Um, yeah. And those are fun. And then we have a tr family tradition of St. Nicholas giving children Christmas ornaments in their stockings. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of like, oh, this is your particular saint. Like there's a St. Therese ornament for Sophia, whose middle name is Therese. And there's a St. Anthony ornament and a um st yeah. francis ornament we didn't and... think that through too much because five ornaments every year after five years that's 25 ornaments 
It's a lot. That's a lot of ornaments. We need a bigger tree. Mm. <laughs> or two trees. Or two trees. Yes. Let's do two trees. Anyway, uh, the, 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 the idea is that eventually they will have their own sets of ornaments. So when they move out and have their own first Christmas tree, it won't be quite as bare as our first Christmas tree Although, was. I think I got some ornaments I brought from my mom's collection. I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. In fact, there's like an elf on the shelf ornament that I, I purposely left behind because I found that thing creepy as all get out. It wasn't yeah. elf. They didn't have elf on the shelf when I was a kid, but it's that elf. You, you didn't have any like ornaments that you hang on the tree. You had some like like a ceramic Christmas no, no, tree. I, and that. That, that, that. I thought I had some no. ornaments. That I, Our I, first Christmas tree had like. We, the generic bulbs from we, we had we had Walgreens. like one box of generic bulbs from Walgreens and we had some olive wood ornaments that I bought when the people from uh, Bethlehem came to the parish and were selling like little handmade carved olive wood ornaments. Oh right, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, well, I mean that's what you expect with your first tree. Yeah, you, you and, it was a, and it was a teeny ornament. tiny tree that that sat on the table because um, we didn't want Bella cl- crawling and yeah. pulling on the, the yeah. big tree. Yes, <laughs> or eating it. Well, the other one thing I did was I, I as I opened the box with all the decorations in it, I I said thank you to the two, January me because I had the foresight to put each strand of lights as we were taking down last year's tree. I put each one in its own Ziploc bag so I didn't have to untangle multiple strands. It was all nice and neat. Like I said, some are dead. I, like, I don't know, like. If it's the heat of the summer in the shed that kills the old ones, I don't know what it is, but uh, but we luckily we had enough it's the Christmas light planned obsolescence. Did genie Christmas, Chris, evil Christmas spirit? Yeah. It's Grinch. the wasps. They get in there. Something. <laughs> yeah, something gets in there and kills them. But uh, yeah, or, or it's Home Depot has a plan like has a chip in it that kills it every three years. After three years, so you have to go buy new ones. Uh, but. I was kind of disappointed because I want to put some lights up in the office, but we we ran out. Uh, but uh, we got plenty of decorations. The, and the other thing the nice thing was this year, the kids like Bella and Sophie really took the lead on decorating. Yeah, I like this. Definitely. They're old enough now. It's their thing. They can they can reach the top of the tree and all that sort of stuff. And they went around hanging garland around the house and all that. They they get really into it. And it's fine. I'm happy happy for that. And I'm happy to sit back and I put the lights on. But other than that, I'm happy to sit back and watch them put the put the ornaments on. That's that's their thing. It's much more serene now than it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was kind it's of a little ninety nine percent less screaming. Yes, yes, there was. Yes, that is true. That is true. Um, I mean, they used to be very enthusiastic, but also very impatient and easily what, frustrated yeah, and one of you handing out ornaments to five of them yeah, yeah that was and they're waiting and waiting and they want the next one and you put yours right next to mine etc cetera, etc cetera. you're doing it wrong you're do- <laughs> wrong yes oh boy there's too, there's too many in one place it's unbalanced yeah so that was that and of course uh, you all know if you're a mom what happens is like after the kids are done when they're in the other room you go around and like redistribute the ornaments so that they're <laughs> properly spaced, right? I sense a great disturbance in the in the in the Christmas force that there are too many ornaments in one part of the tree. They're clumpy. <laughs> they're clumpy. It's just wrong. See, you I wish I, fix it. I wish I had like a nice smoking jacket and a wingback chair, and I could just sit in the corner and watch as my my uh, barons all decorate the tree in front of me, uh-huh. while my my hunting dog sits beside me, and I drink a brandy. What is it about Christmas that makes people like long for cliches that never were? <laughs> <laughs> because we've seen all the movies and the and the uh, and the uh, paintings and the postcards. Something. Uh, it's very home- homey and comforting. I think is what we want. Yes, and this year especially. This year especially. So uh, okay. So earlier this week, we we had talked about last time about Lucy having her allergy food test, the food challenge, and she passed on the eggs, so she can eat eggs now. And we had another one this past week, which we were hoping would be. We told everyone we were hoping it would be milk and or wheat, uh, and it turned out it, neither. She was she was kind of disappointed. Yeah. Uh, so what happened? She, she did actually pass the food challenge, but it was for pecans. <laughs> 
<laughs> and the poor thing she she was not exactly burning with desire like there to was not there was not a pecan hole shaped hole in her life <laughs> that, that was desperately needing to be filled and so she was kind of like we had promised that if she could if you, I mean, foolishly perhaps <laughs> yes that if she passed like the dairy challenge we'd get her ice cream on the way home yeah. and i think that was probably tactical error because she was very disappointed i did however i made candied pecans for her and she liked them she was dubious she was dubious but but nevertheless once she'd made them she ate one and she was like oh it's okay and she came back later and she ate another one Th- that child. and then and then she came back later and <laughs> she was eating a whole bunch of them and coming back and back and back so she did like them but Th- that child has my skeptical gene she like it's like meh. I'm I'm I I don't trust you. I don't believe you. I'm not ready. To, I'm not prepared to concede any point to you at this moment. Just try it. All right. Hey, this is good. Like <laughs> no, no, but she won't say hey, it's good. No, It'll no. be like I I guess it's not horrible. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. <laughs> I, I I guess it didn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not dead that. yet. <laughs> not dead yet. But so we have another one this coming Tuesday, and I don't know. The, the doctors seem to think uh, last week that the most likely candidates were corn and pecans. So we may be doing corn, which at least she'd be able to eat corn chips. Okay. Corn tortillas. Tortillas, tortilla chips. Okay. This may not be the most exciting thing for her, but for us, Corn would be a big win because, as we have said many times, corn is in everything. Corn syrup, corn starch, corn everything. I, I was really hoping for the, doc- the doctor had seemed very hopeful about dairy, and I'm kind of disappointed that that right. didn't happen. Well, let's keep at it. She can still do the powdered dairy and baked and things. So that seems like it's still going to happen at some point. We just got to keep at it. Um, but the corn, like if we can get the corn knocked out and she was actually, it was cute. It was sweet. She was really hoping for wheat because she wants to be able to receive her first communion in the, on the Eucharist this fall, this spring. And both species. Under both species. She, I mean, she could, you know, we've talked about this before. We've talked about it, but yeah. yeah so, yeah. but she was, she was expressing that that was what she was hoping for. Even over ice cream and over the other stuff, she was hoping for wheat. So that was sweet. So... Pray, we'll pray for the for good results in the next one. Uh, so speaking of food that we've been eating, uh, we it's Christmas is coming, so we've been doing a lot of, you've been doing a lot of baking, and we've been doing a lot of thinking and preparing and shopping. Uh, we're probably going to have a rib roast. We're de- well, we're definitely having probably. a rib roast. <laughs> it's in the refrigerator. In the we're probably going to be eating it at some point, <laughs> yeah. If it doesn't go bad no it, it'll be fine so we're gonna have a rib roast for christmas day dinner uh whole foods had it on sale again this year this hopefully this is like an annual thing i think so but the best part is so we you can order whole foods delivery through the amazon website since amazon owns the whole foods right the best part is i had taken some survey with uh a internet company that we do business with and they had promised, like, oh, we'll pick a certain number of people to win a gift card. And I'm like, you, you know, you know you, you, you're like, I'm never going to win that, but I'll, I'll do the survey anyway. And I won a $100 gift card to Amazon, which was awesome because we spent it on Christmas dinner. Yeah, that was that was pretty awesome. Like, it was like the same day that we ordered it. It was, it was pretty good. That was special. So uh, our Christmas dinner is on this Internet company. Uh, so rib roast and... We don't even really. What else are we gonna have? Um, well, kind of depends on what we find at the you store. Butternut squash. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna do that, and then we'll do our traditional seafood Christmas Eve, right? Which we've talked about before, but yeah, well, you will you'll hear all about that next week. But uh, you've been doing some cooking this past week. You made pasties again. Mm-hmm. I had some leftover pulled pork, and what did I do? I just think I declared on Friday that. We were not going to have school. It was a snow day. And so I decided to just spend the afternoon cooking instead of doing schoolwork. (laughs) Right. I gave myself a snow day and I, I've been wanting to make pasties for a while. Like every time I open the freezer and I see that pulled pork, I'm like, I want to make pasties, but I don't have time because it's, it's a several hours process to like 
Bake the dough. Bake the dough. Because it's like six cups of flour and four sticks of butter. Like it's an entire pound of butter that you have to cut into the flour. And it makes a substantial number of pasties. Like this is that's like this two was, meals worth. It was 16 pasties. Right. Um, right. And, and it, one pasty is a lot. Like that could be dinner for one kid. Right. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not really worth it if you're not going to make a whole bunch of them as for it. That's what I figure. But right. Because um, it's not that much less work to make like a half recipe. Right. And they'll eat them. So right. might as well make them. Yeah. So, yeah, they were really good. Like, I think that this one, these were better than the last batch. But I think that was just because the pulled pork was better seasoned. The, it was really good. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the last one, the first ones you made were, were good. But this was, yeah, substantially improved. And I think it was because these this was the new way of making the pulled pork. That you this did. was the pulled pork made with a cola syrup. Right. It. It was it was excellent. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I did I did I, I played with the seasonings a bit on the meat mixture. Right. Uh, and you added in what you add in like uh, some veggies. Yeah, I had some celery, carrot, onion, potato and some peas and corn. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was good. Lucy liked the filling, too. I, I I gave her some minus the peas and corn. And she just had a bowl of the pasty filling for dinner. Right. She, she liked it a lot. Yeah. It was it was it was good on its own. And uh, OK, so we had pasties. Y'all, today you also made gingerbread. I did. I I had a hankering for gingerbread. I, I'm not one of these people who like bakes a million types of cookies and like doesn't let anybody eat them until Christmas Day. And then like they all come out on Christmas Day. I don't know. I admire people who do that, but. I just don't have that kind of discipline or something. Or the ability to store large quantities we, but of But yeah, we heads. also don't have room to store things. So I just kind of, through the end of Advent and the whole Christmas season, I just kind of steadily bake things and we eat them. And one loaf of gingerbread lasts our family maybe two rounds of dessert. Yeah, yeah. If that. Right. So the gingerbread, you made it with a cream cheese frosting because... Cream cheese. You love cream cheese frosting. I love cream cheese frosting. <laughs> I've never you actually put it on everything. I've never actually made gingerbread with cream free, cream cheese frosting before. Easy for you to say. Uh, but I, when I was browsing through recipes, I found one and I said, you know, I'm going to try that. It sounds good, hmm. and it was. Yes, it was good. I love gingerbread. Um. So now, since I've been doing the food shopping while you're recuperating, uh, I've been sort of. Then the one at the store going, hmm, this is an interesting ingredient. Let's make something with that. Yes. So I picked up a head of Napa cabbage last time we were there. Actually, it was like two weeks ago. And it lasts in the fridge. Right. Yeah. Cabbage cabbage is great because it does. There's like a half a head of cabbage in the back of the uh, vegetable drawer that's been in there. I think when you made summer's coleslaw or something. I mean, it's been in there. We need to do yeah. something with it. Uh, but yeah, it lasts. It's it's a, like an ever storage thing. But uh, so I had it and I was trying to figure out what to do with it. And we decided on a stir fry. We actually, we independently figured out the same chicken, uh, stir fr- chicken w- uh, breast with stir fry with Napa cabbage. Well, when you Google chicken and, and Napa, Napa cabbage, you get a stir fry recipe. <laughs> yeah. So this is the yeah. top hits. So we didn't make we didn't make one of the recipes. It was just uh, we got the inspiration. I mean, it's just a basic stir fry: chicken, carrot. You basically go well, through the refrigerator you and you, you see what we have for vegetables, and you go through the freezer and see what we have for meat, and then you yeah. kind of throw what makes something it together. different is the sauce, and you're the now the queen of the stir fry sauces, and you did something different this time. Uh, yeah, I kind of wanted a peanutty sauce, but of course, with Lucy's peanut allergies, we can't do that. Um, and Isabella can't have cashews. Uh, but I have and a pecan uh, sauce would be just weird. Pecan sauce? <laughs> I have. Well, now the Chinese restaurant in Austin that my family goes to used to put like the toasted spice pecans on their poo poo platter. But I don't think that they ever put them in dishes. In a sauce. No, no, in no. In the no. sauce. Yeah. Anyway, I I did have a jar of almond butter that was staring me in the face as I was mixing up the sauce. And I thought, huh. Almond butter is what we used as a substitute for peanut butter on like almond butter sandwiches. And I kind of like the flavor. And when you like you, to, to say, like, if you're making a Thai stir fry or something like that with peanut sauce or Vietnamese, you have to have peanut sauces. Usually it's peanut butter that is the ingredient that it calls right. for. So, so, so peanut butter, I, almond butter. I substituted almond butter for peanut butter and I made it like a sesame almond butter sauce. It had 
soy sauce and rice wine vinegar and uh, garlic ginger sauce. Mm-hmm. Not garlic ginger. Garlic chili paste. Garlic chili paste. I always yes, say yes. garlic ginger. It's garlic chili paste. And I put some fresh grated ginger in it, too. Yep. Uh, and sesame oil. It was really good. It was really good. This is... Let's do that, that again. again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Anthony, I got to keep him away from the bowl because he kept dipping his finger into the bowl, like Into tasting the sauce. It. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, no, stop eating it. I'm putting it in the, in the stir fry. Well, I really love peanut sauces, and it's it's been it's made me sad that we haven't been able to have them. So I, I don't know why it took me so long to figure out almond butter as a as a substitute. It would have been really good too. Yeah. If I'm not sure, like crushed almonds would work. Like like a lot of times, peanut sauce has like the crushed peanuts. But yeah, what might be good is crushed pistachios. Hmm. Pistachios, but not pistachio, like, not like. Like, like, peel the pistachios, stick them in a bag, pound them with a hammer, right? And then sprinkle the. But use the almond butter for the sauce, right? So you get the crunch of the pistachio, but the flavor of the almond, right? That'd be kind of interesting, yeah, yeah. Because you do, yeah. I like they. A lot of times they call for the chunky peanut butter, so because you get a little more texture out of it. That might be interesting. And and almonds, well, well, I don't know. You crush it up an almond, it doesn't have the right texture mm, yeah. as, as a pistachio. No, no, yeah, yeah. Um, and the Napa cabbage in the stir fry was really good. I, I I put it in near the end to just wilt it a little bit, um, because you don't you, you the one of the nice things about Napa cabbage or any cabbage is the crunch. So right, you want you want it to be a bit crunchy. Yeah. So that I, that came out. I overwhelmed the the walk a little bit though. <laughs> like once it, like a whole head of Napa cabbage makes a whole lot of Napa cabbage, and I have to make a lot of stir fry for our family. I need a bigger walk. Is what we need a bigger is. walk. I need a bigger walk. Uh, the, the only complaint about the stir fry actually was was Ben said there was no broccoli. The which was cheered by some of the other children. So this is a balancing act here. Some of the children do not like broccoli in their stir fry. Ben and you and I like broccoli. I love broccoli. Yes, broccoli is one of the most perfect vegetables. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's what we've been eating. Uh, before we move on to the rest of our discussion, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Bets, including Robert G., Chris E., Ann T., Caleb P., and Michael M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Raising the Bets and all the shows at StarQuest. And now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron. Thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter, when you Start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give. The first three months of your pledge will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So if you become a new patron at $10 a month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all our shows, including Raising the Bets, which will make your gift go even further. So if you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now is a great time. Uh, gifts to SQPN are tax deductible. S- S- SQPN StarQuest is a 501c3 a nonprofit in the US. So visit sqpn.com slash give today. Uh, before we go on, I do want to mention something that we probably should have mentioned at the top, which is uh, ask for prayers for my brother in law and his family. Um, my, my sister's husband, Pete, uh, his mom died this just, the, just yesterday. Was it already? Just yesterday. yesterday. Just yesterday as we record. So if you could uh, say a prayer for. Uh, for uh, Mrs. Campbell, um, that would be really appreciated. It right before Christmas, it's a tough thing, you know, for them to go through. And uh, they lost his dad um, like ten years ago now. Yeah, I so think he just had ten tenth anniversary. So, um, if you could say a quick prayer for Mrs. Campbell and for the Campbell family, I would really appreciate it. So that was something, and because of the the situation we're all in, the funeral is going to be tricky some will be some will go some won't go and it's you know you know how that is anyway so let's move on to so i appreciate your prayers so let's move on to uh what we've been reading or watching what have you been reading melanie i'm still plugging away at patrick (laughs) o'brien uh it's a long novel and i'm going slow yep i keep getting distracted but i wanted to mention actually one of the books i've been enjoying with the kids which is an advent uh, it's a book of advent advent meditations i suppose it's called all creation waits the advent mystery of new beginnings by gail boss 
uh, with beautiful woodcut illustrations by David Klein. And uh, basically, uh, the author is from, I think, Michigan. Yeah, she lives in Michigan. And basically for every day of December, like a traditional advent calendar, 24 days, um, there's a meditation on an animal and how that animal gets through the cold winter season. So we've got black bear, chickadee, honeybee, uh, turkeys, opossums, raccoons, frogs, loons. So it's kind of a nature study book. Like, how do animals hibernate or store food or migrate or whatever through the winter? But there's there's sort of a implicit but not really explicit parallel between what the animals are doing and our sort of spiritual lives. Um, the book ends on day 24, Christmas Eve with Jesus the Christ, or Christmas Day with Jesus the Christ. So it is explicitly Christian like at the end, but there's sort of this idea of like our spiritual lives being like storing up, preparing, getting through the cold times, waiting for the light, waiting for the return of life. There's there's all of these beautiful little hidden hints in each of the animal meditations that don't hit you over the head, but that as we talked about them with the kids, there was all these like really fun little animal facts, but it also kind of got you thinking. Hmm. So it's not, I don't know, it, it feels like it's a nice balance between um, uh, nature and faith. Uh, the, the blurb from the back of the book says, the dark is not an end, but a way, but the way a new beginning comes. Hmm. So it's very much about sort of Advent is a season of waiting, preparation. It looks kind of like nothing's going on, but lots of things are happening under the surface. And I really liked that idea. I thought there was a richness to it that I didn't expect. Cool. And it's really beautiful. <laughs> the, the writing is really lovely and uh, the, the woodcuts are gorgeous. Awesome. I definitely want to you know, read it again and again. So uh, maybe folks can get that for next Advent. Yeah. It's a little late for this app. Yeah. So I'm still working my way through the latest Brandon Sanderson book in his uh, Stormlight Archive. It's going to be a while. <laughs> <laughs> These are big books. I'm like, I'm 8% through it after a week. Wow. This is, <laughs> I, I felt, I was feeling bad about being like yeah. 50% through uh, Post Captain. Post Captain. Yeah. No, this, this I, uh, I read the, the most recent one last year and I thought this was going to really mess up my Goodreads. Uh, um, getting to my goal, and thankfully I read all of the Dresden files, and that really pushed me over the top. So, um, I held this one until now, so that I could. I've I already passed my goal for 2020, so I won't be so far behind when I start 2021. <laughs> Strategic, S right? strategic reading. This is not something I do. It's so. gamifying my reading. Right. It's, I don't understand. Ever but, since okay. I started the Goodreads thing, I've been reading a lot more. You but, have. Been reading more I, yes. I i have noticed that, that this this has had a positive effect so i'm not yes. complaining it's just funny because the gamifying for, game, gamifying it's a guy thing yeah <laughs> totally uh so i've been watching and uh, one of the things i've been watching is the latest season of the expanse has dropped on uh on amazon oh i am so glad that amazon picked up the expanse after sci-fi dropped it after season two so i the expanse book series I I loved I loved it. It was great. Uh, and I thought it was done, but apparently there's another one coming out, which is really good because the way they left the last book, I was like, oh. Uh, but and so I know what's coming. And as this season, season five starts, I totally know what's coming. Whereas people who haven't read the books don't. And so, like, there's a lot of like, oh. Oh, oh, yes, you, you, you characters don't know what's gonna, oh, yeah, like, and, and I have to be honest, I found this part of the book series with it, this covers a little confusing. I got a little lost in the machinations of the various plot points, and I, so I just powered through it, but watching the series 
is helping me to it's clear make clarify it because it's all simplified obviously it has to be simple or then a book um i just love the experience experience because of the uh the the scientific uh this it's what what do you call science fiction where it's more accurate to sci- actual science it's a hard science hard, hard science hard science I think with this show, they've gotten a little further away from the hard science aspect because in the books, it takes months to get anywhere in the solar system. Like even because they don't have fast than light travel, it's it's regular old slower than light travel, except for I don't want to spoil anything. But there's there's something that happens where that that is kind of gets How around that not spoiling because it happens fairly early on. OK, yeah, but. In general, they, it's all regular old rockets pushing you through space it, it, at higher speed than we have now because they've developed a new technology. That, but it's still regular old rockets. So it takes ages and months to get anywhere. And I like that. I like that real, the, the limitations it puts on the story. You know, being able to warp somewhere in a, in a minute right. makes it easy. This puts real limitations on the plot. Anyway. Constraint is good. Yes, constraint is good. And uh, so, the and the... Uh, so, several of the actors in this are so good. Like the uh, actress who plays, I cannot pronounce her name. She's she's Persian actress, and she's been in a bunch of different things. But she plays Christian Avasarala, who is one of the best characters in the books, and she's the perfect actress for the character uh, on screen. Uh, so so good, so good. Uh, so so they've uh, they've dropped the first three episodes uh, right off the bat, and then they'll one at a time after that. So I watched that. Um, and then I decided to catch up on some of my favorite Christmas movies I haven't watched in years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I watched Die Hard. <laughs> Which, yes, everyone it is seems Christmas to be... It is Christmas until yeah. Hans Gruber drops from the 30th floor of the Nakatomi Plaza. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> with Alan Rickman as the suave German terrorist. I mean, just awesome. Alan Rickman is great in that. Um, so very 80s. Such an 80s movie. And speaking of 80s movies, last night I watched... Christmas Vacation, Chevy Chase. Like th- they would never make these movies the same way today. They just they just can't make these movies anymore like this. Uh, so, uh, and I've got Home Alone uh, as well. I picked them up like on sale on like iTunes or something. Uh-huh. Uh, and I've got Home Alone. I would like to watch Home Alone with the kids. I think the kids would love Home Alone. Yes, yes. They, I, I, I I actually kind of endorse watching Home okay. Alone with the kids. So some afternoon this week, we'll watch Home Alone with the kids. I think that would be great. Uh, because, yeah, this, I remember watching that the first time. And in his hyster- I was literally in I, hysterics. I, I, can, I can hear them already how much, oh, how hard they're going to be laughing. My gosh, it is going to be hilarious. So and that brings to mind something that I was talking with Jimmy Aiken about. And he's come up with a classification for Christmas movies. Class one, class two and class three. OK. A class one Christmas movie is one that is about the Christmas event itself, i.e. about the nativity. A, a story about Jesus and Mary and going right. to Bethlehem so, and b- baby being born. There's a movie thing. called The Nativity Story, The Little Drummer Boy. Like, these are all class one okay. Christmas movies. Sure. A class two movie is a Christmas movie, is a movie that takes place at Christmas and is about Christmas events. So a family celebrating Christmas, like, It's a Wonderful Life? Christmas Vacation. Uh, oh, hold on, with it's one okay. for a second. Uh, Christmas Vacation, oh, White Christmas, the Bing Crosby, you know, movie. Uh, the, the, Christmas so, Story. Christmas Story, yes. All of these would be Christmas, cr- cr- class two Christmas movies. Okay. Class three are movies that take place at Christmas, but Christmas is not the central point of the story. Oh, sorry. So, uh, by the way, like Scrooge or Christmas Carol would be a class two. Right. Christmas is central to the plot. But, like um, Die Hard takes place at Christmas, but Christmas is not central to the plot. It, it, it's sort of a... There's a Christmas party, but it could be any kind of party. Right. Yeah. It could have been a New Year's party or a... Right. Or Fourth of July party, for that matter. I mean, it could be anything. Uh, it just happened to be Christmas. I, I suppose It's a Wonderful Life is sort of like that. Well, that's the question. So Jimmy was saying it's a class two Christmas movie, but really, most of... What It's a Wonderful Life takes place not at Christmas. Right. Very little of it takes place at and Christmas. In, and in fact, the only Christmassy part of it is the very end where they're in the parlor with the Christmas tree. Right. And they sing Auld Lang Syne, which isn't really a Christmas song. Well, but, it's, but the frame narrative, it's Christmas 
when he right when Clarence talks to Joseph, right in heaven. It's Christmas. It, it's Christmas, and and the, the the frame is it's Christmas. He's in despair. He goes right. back and he sees that his entire life has had a point, and now we're back at Christmas again. Right. So the so, frame is so it's 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 it's. I and mean, in a way, you could you could argue that it's like a Christmas Carol, which is like Scrooge goes is taken back to its past, but it's just like the the past part of a Christmas Carol without the future and the present. Yes, yes. Ba- basically, it's essentially it's a Christmas Life Carol is a Christ- is a remake of a Christmas Carol, but where you only do Christmas past, not yes, not future and present. Speaking of remakes, uh huh. Be prepared, prepare yourself. I've heard that they're making a remake of It's a Wonderful Life starring Pete Davidson from Sunday Night Live. I don't know that who oh, that is, but if you if you had seen him and stuff, you would you, your your top would flip. Like like never mind remaking It's a Wonderful Life. Do, there well, are things we, that do not need to be things, remade. Things don't need to be remade, and It's a Wonderful Life is definitely get a your own life. Christmas new movie. Stop messing with everybody's stuff. Like, like seriously, Frank Capra does does not need to, you don't need to ta- try to top Frank right, Capra. Right. There are things that have been done well and should not be done again. Like, don't, no one's gonna ever remake The Godfather. <laughs> it, it is The Godfather I, and that should be it. I, I guarantee you somebody at some point is going to try to remake The Godfather. It will, hopefully Martin Scorsese will come back and haunt that person. <laughs> because Probably. <laughs> you'll wake up to find a ghost uh, horse head in his bed. <laughs> mm, that would be appropriate. So, should I think of other like so? Home Alone is definitely a class two Christmas movie. Yes, it takes place at Christmas. Christmas is a central part of the plot. Right. Who who goes away with their whole family to Paris for Christmas? But that's a whole nother question. <laughs> I, I would if I could. Right, right, right. So Christmas Vacation, class two. There aren't a lot of class one Christmas movies if you no. think about it. Most are about people's celebration of Christmas. Well, because the the Christmas story is well, it is what it is, and and we 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 all know it. We love it. You could tell the character stories around it, like you could tell, like the Little Drummer Boy. Right, right. like the, there's a whole genre of of kids books that are like stories which take place. There were a, there had to be a lot of people at that table because there's so many kids books with the characters. Right. Yeah, told around. from the point of view of of the shepherds or the king, the magi, or you know, some little the spider uh, on the wall. <laughs> the animals in the stable, <laughs> lots of animals in the stable books because you know kids love animal books, right? Um, yeah, and we've got we've got a few of those. Yes, yes, and I, and I like them. They're fun. They're they're, but you really don't need that many of them. What would you think about a Holly and Ivy movie? Like the the kids book to, to make the kids book into a movie. That would be really fun. Holly and Ivy is one of my favorite kids books. It's yeah, it's by Rumor Godden who is one of my favorite authors. Catholic author. Um, and uh, the illustrations of the copy that we have are by Barbara Cooney, who is one of my favorite children's book illustrators. It is a perfect marriage. Like Barbara Cooney's illustrations are gorgeous. So Holly and Ivy is a story about wishing. But I think really in Rumor Garden's universe, wishing is it an analogy to prayer. So they're really books about prayer but for the sort of it's sort of far evangelization the pre-evangelization it's not the right. gospel but it's about our need for prayer in our lives and holly and ivy is, is about grace really right so it's about a little girl named ivy who's an orphan and a little doll named holly who's a christmas doll right and, and the, the story b- bounces back and forth between the point of view of the doll and the girl and the doll is in a toy shop where all the toys are being sold the week before Christmas. And she really, really wants to be sold. And for, for the toys, all they want is, is to, to be a Christmas present to, to be, you know, I want a, a boy or a girl to take me and love me and make me real. Um, and because it's Christmas, uh, the which one's the doll? Holly? Holly. She knows that her time is coming up because no one's going to want a Christmas doll after Christmas. Right. So she's going to you know, be sent back to storage if she doesn't sell on Christmas Eve. Right. And then Ivy, uh, Ivy, the little girl, um, all the orphans in the orphanage. She's an orphan. Right. She's an orphan who lives in an orphanage. All the orphans in the orphanage have been borrowed by <laughs> <laughs> borrowed. It's Victorian or whatever. It's, right. It's very or, the, the early sort of, 20th century. Sort Edwardian of, or something. Families who feel sorry for the orphans who have them come and stay with them for Christmas for Christmas 
and then they go back to the orphanage afterwards. Anyway, all of the orphans are taken in except Ivy. And so the, the, the head of the orphanage has to go nurse a sick relative who has scarlet fever. And so she, she can't take Ivy with her because she might get sick. And so she decides to send her to the infant's home. Like there are, I guess, sister orphanage where they take care of little babies and Ivy who's six is a f- horribly offended at the idea that she's going to be bundled off to spend her Christmas with the babies, with the babies. Uh, but she's put onto a train by herself with a tag to tell the conductor where to get her off. And presumably they will tell the, whoever comes to meet her at the train very different time isn't um, this <laughs> which is reminiscent of you know the, the evacuees yeah in world war ii children right. were put onto trains yeah. right with with tags. luggage tags uh but ivy takes her tag off throws it away and she has an idea a story that she's told to comfort herself and to push away the loneliness that she has a grandmother who lives in the town of appleton and it just so happens that the train she's put on stops in Appleton. And so she gets off the train and goes looking for her grandmother and she wanders into a Christmas market and she has a little bit of money that she's been given for Christmas. So she buys herself toffee apples and hot roasted chestnuts and a uh, hot cider and a balloon. And then she sees the doll in the window and falls in love with her. And then she ends up sleeping in a shed that's that backs up to a bakery where it's like where the ovens are where the, where the ovens, ovens are warm. warm. Yeah. Um. And uh, she. Well, do you want to give give away the the ending or? It involves a policeman and his and his wife. They they're involved. Yes. And and the little boy who works at the toy store. It, yeah. It's a beautiful story. It's a it's a story where which has a very happy, if slightly improbable ending. <laughs> More than slightly. <laughs> but it's a story of grace. And so it's a, almost a miraculous ending. So it's a Christmas miracle. Right. I, I, I don't know. It's I mean, Rumor Godden is a beautiful storyteller and she makes it feel real and. But also there's it, it, nothing is a foregone conclusion. So there's a bit of tension and danger or in it and you feel right especially as a parent like no 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 don't get off the train don't 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 get off the train little little (laughs) six-year-old girls wandering around by themselves in winter in the snow yes it's i've seen this one that's the little match girl (laughs) don't go oh there's yeah there's a little bit of playing with that trope isn't there yes oh I, i was traumatized by the little match girl as an adult we need to my kids i love the little match girl oh my gosh the I'm a big Hans Christian. She Anderson. dies in the snow. I know she dies with the vision of her grandmother. She still dies. Oh. This is, I, I think this might be, in fact, Rumor Garden's anti match girl. Like girl, rewriting yes. the little match girl so that it has a happy ending. This should be a class two Christmas movie. Holly and Ivy. Somebody make it happen. Should we get, should we get my I nephew think... to write the screenplay? <laughs> it would have to be like a short, like I wouldn't want it to be TV longer. Movie. Longer than like thirty minutes. At no, most. no, 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 no. It would be longer. No, not thirty minutes. You couldn't tell that story in thirty minutes. Yes, you could. Not visually. Not a visual story like that. No, no, no. No, I see, be... I'm thinking it's it's kind of similar to like the snowman, you know, which is like the movie with no words. It's just like the little boy going on the winter ride with the snowman. Oh, we have very different I... sensibilities see, here. Because I think because <laughs> I think that it would be best with with because so much of it is interior. What the what the characters are thinking. I think you could tell it with a lot of like no. beautiful music no. with, without a whole lot of words. Okay, you've just ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it needs to be like an, it needs to be like a TV movie, like an hour, an hour, hour and a half movie. Oh, you that's could, I, be way too long. You could, to, I could totally do it. I could, like, I, mean, I could write the screenplay right here. All oh. right, so this is my this is my future goal. Twenty twenty one, you will see Holly and Ivy screenplay by by Domenico Bettinelli on Apple TV Plus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a Christmas miracle. All right, we should move on. So let's talk about the fourth Sunday of Advent and uh, the mass we had. So we had went to mass at our parish. We all got to go. Yay! Not all of us got to stay through the whole mass. Sadly, we we had a asthma attack, or not asthma attack, breathing. It was a a not full on attack, but but definitely an, an issue. An issue where an inhaler would have been welcome, and somehow we had managed to have 
removed inhalers from two coat pockets and two handbags. Despite three people who would who benefit from having an inhaler at times, none of um, them had it. Yeah, my inhaler was in my other coat and in my other purse, and Bella's had run out, and I think I had given her or one of mine, but then it ended up in her backpack instead of her purse. And Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so you had to leave Mass and didn't get to receive communion, which is uh, a, a regretful, but um, you did get to say through the homily. Which uh, I mostly was awake for. Which, uh, so we occasionally, and some people may recognize his name, so we, we occasionally have Masses with Father Willie Raymond as a guest uh, priest. Father Willie is from the Holy Cross Fathers, Holy the the ones who run the Father Peyton Center, and they do a lot of media outreach, media yeah, work. Yeah, Okay, and uh, it's, Saint, Saint Andre Bissett's order. Yeah, so he's um, he's actually really well known. People like know him. He's like known in Hollywood as you know, this, this you know the Catholic priest in Hollywood and all that sort of stuff. But so he says mass for us uh, regularly, and yeah, he's he's kind of soft spoken, and he doesn't come across as he's, media he's not he's not flashy and his homilies aren't flashy but they're really solid yes so today he actually read a huge chunk maybe all of i'm not 100 percent sure because i was not exactly <laughs> awake through the whole thing <laughs> yes but of the the sermon from saint bernardo clairvaux from today's the four sunday of advent office of readings and uh in case you don't know who bernardo clairvaux is he's a french 12th century Doctor of the Church, Cistercian... Cistercian Abbot. Cistercian Abbot, yes. So, do you want me to read it? Do you want to read it? We uh, didn't actually talk about this before. We didn't yet. actually... Uh, I'll read it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to need to make it bigger so you can see it with your eyes. My bad eyesight. Yeah, here we go. That's bigger. Uh, the whole world awaits Mary's reply. You have heard, O Virgin, that you will conceive and bear a son. You have heard that it will not be by man, but by the Holy Spirit. The angel awaits an answer. It is time for him to return to God who sent him. We too are waiting, O lady, for your word of compassion. The sentence of condemnation weighs heavily upon us. The price of our salvation is offered to you. We shall be set free at once, if you consent. In the eternal word of God, we all came to be, and behold, we die. In your brief response, we are to be remade in order to be recalled to life. Tearful Adam, with his sorrowing family, begs this of you, O loving virgin, in their exile from paradise. Abraham begs it. David begs it. All the other holy patriarchs, your ancestors, ask it of you as they dwell in the country of the shadow of death. This is what the whole earth waits for, prostrate at your feet. It is in right of doing so. It is right in doing so, for on your word depends comfort for the wretched, ransom for the captive, freedom for the condemned, indeed salvation for all the sons of Adam, the whole of your race. Answer quickly, O virgin, reply in haste to the angel, or rather, through the angel, to the Lord. Answer with a word. Receive the word of God. Speak your own word. Conceive the divine word, breathe a passing word, embrace the eternal word. Why do you delay? Why are you afraid? Believe, give praise and receive. Let humility be bold, let modesty be confident. This is no time for virginal simplicity to forget prudence. In this matter alone, O prudent virgin, do not fear to be presumptuous. Though modest silence is pleasing, dutiful speech is now more necessary. Open your heart to faith, O blessed Virgin, your lips to praise, your womb to the Creator. See, the desired of all nations is at your door, knocking to enter. If he should pass by because of your delay, in sorrow you would begin to seek him afresh, the one whom your soul loves. Arise, hasten, open, arise in faith. Hasten in devotion, open in praise and thanksgiving. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, she says. Be it done to me according to your word. What an interesting approach to the the Annunciation. He catches that moment and extends it, expands it. That moment between Gabriel's announcement and Mary's response 
and this whole meditation is sort of that that breathless wait for it wait for it moment <laughs> little hamilton there yeah <laughs> wait for it but my my favorite part of this is actually the um if he should pass by because of your delay and sorrow you would begin to seek him afresh the one whom your soul loves that reminds me of the bride in the song of songs have you seen him who my soul loves when she goes searching through the city for the bridegroom right for the beloved Oh, I love that image of Mary as the bride searching for the beloved. Right. The, the, the soul in response to God yearning and longing and, and going and hunting for him. One thing it makes clear is, is that Mary's fiat was free, a free choice. Yes. A friend of mine uh, shared with me a poem that was um, clearly written from a pa- place of pain and suffering, but in which the author implied that Mary was not given a free choice. Hmm. And it was very distressing. I mean, clearly this person had been in some sort of a situation where religion had been abused in their life as a controlling factor. Right. And so you, I, I, it left me with only deep, deep sympathy for the author, but sadness too, that, they had not really experienced the fullness of the gospel, which is that God wants us to have a choice. Right. That all of creation hinges on, all of salvation hinges on a free choice. Mary's freedom is first and foremost. And it's not clear to me that, so it's kind of complicated, but it's not clear to me that if Mary had said no, it's not clear to me that God would have said, okay, well, we'll find someone else. Right. That Mary's net, yes, was absolutely necessary. And while her choice was free, it, it it was foreseen that it would be yes. It's the paradox of free will of, of uh, and a God who... Who knows everything. Who knows everything. And, and is outside of time. <laughs> right. So so there is that. So that to, to, don't break your brain thinking about it. I, my mind gets a little squirrely when I do. But in any case, I love this idea of the... You know, now is not the time to be modest and humble. <laughs> You've got to grab hold with two hands and say, yes, yes, yes. There's also this, this I, the gorgeousness of recounting salvation history, like all of her ancestors, all of the patriarchs waiting for this young girl. Right. Right. You feel the whole weight of those generations <laughs> upon generations of patriarchs all just hanging out there in the shadow of death, waiting. <laughs> No pressure. Waiting? <laughs> no pressure on you, but uh, we're all kind of waiting. Uh, also, and you pointed this out, is the, the, the duality of, you know, give the word and receive the word. Right. Oh, I love that, that, that phrasing. Bernard is such a beautiful poet. I mean, this is, this is really poetry, even though it's written out as prose. Um, but yeah, breathe a passing word, embrace the eternal word. He does a lot. There's a lot of repetitions in that paragraph. Word, 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 word. Um, right. Mary, Mary's word and then God's word. Or like the other one, which open your heart to faith, your lips to praise, your womb to the creator. Like just open yourself to to all of to God in all these ways. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful. I'll put a link to uh, the the office for also, today. Also, I just want to say that show notes. a lot of times priests feel a need to innovate and sometimes the going back to the classics like Hmm. saint bernard of clairvaux can i write a better sermon than saint bernard of clairvaux (laughs) maybe not (laughs) and this wasn't the the sum total of his sermon he he, he had other remarks that were you know pertinent and timely and unpacking the readings and connecting them to to our daily lives but it was really nice to hear something this beautiful at mass i it's really nice when priests take the time to to incorporate some of the the classics well and when they trust that their congregation will be able to appreciate this you know just throw it out there it, it's like it's like sharing stuff with with your kids like even if it kind of goes over their head a little bit they'll eventually they it, something sinks in well right when we were talking about it in the car on the way home um i reread it and you know, Lucy chimed in. She said, oh, yeah, I remember some of that. Yes. She was paying attention. She did hear it. She recognized it when she heard it again. Um, so, yeah, I I think that 
a lot of times we sell kids short, we sell even adults short, thinking, well, it's going to go over their heads, so why bother? Well, sometimes poetry, beauty does go over our heads and we don't necessarily catch it all. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't move us or make an impression just because you didn't get all the nuances the first time through. Right, right, exactly. So, yeah. And and when you would listen to the Divine Office when the kids were were little, little, and we saw, well, you found like Bella started saying the, the, at, at three and four years old, saying the responses with you. You know, my, my, my favorite was when she would, she would repeat, uh, the cross of the Lord is the tree of life, but it was like dropping the L's. The cross of the Lord is the tree of life. <laughs> it was very cute. <laughs> very cute. So pastors, fathers, share more of this with your congregations. Some may get it, some may not, but put it out there. It's the, it's a gift of the church to us. Share it with us, all of us. But uh, anyway, Bernard of Clairvaux, this was a beautiful reading. Oh. What a great uh, Advent meditation it makes. My my other favorite thing from us is that today's collect is the prayer from the Angelus. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son is made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of the resurrection. Yeah. What was the first reading? I forget now. I don't have it in front of me here, but the, uh, let me, uscb.org and the readings for the fourth, uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent was, oh, King David. Oh, that was the other part of the homily that I liked. I knew there was another part where he talked about, here I sit in this big uh, palace of cedar, this house of cedar, while God is, is in a tent. I'm going to build him a nice temple. And Nathan says, hey, that sounds like a good idea. And then God says, hey, if I want a house, I'll build a house. I get things for you to do. So listen to me. Uh, you know, I'm the one who took you from the shepherd boy to the throne. Well, I, there's so many things I love about that reading. Um, David, you know, you're going to build me a house. I will give you a house. But David is talking about a building and God is talking about all of salvation history. Right. Like I won't give you. I, oh, what a house you will have. It will include my son. <laughs> right. I've got better things in store. Right. Um, I will raise up your heir after you and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your, your throne shall stand firm forever. So, you know, Thanks for the thought for the building a temple, but um, I got that your son, your son will build it in, and, in in more ways than one. Solomon and Jesus, right? And Father Willie, as point pointed out, God is a father who keeps his promises. There, five hundred years for five, about five hundred years, David's sons ruled as kings in Israel, and then there was the the exile. The, the king of the king in Judah was exiled to Babylon and never seen again. Right. And that was the end. There were no more kings. And then 500 years after that, we get Jesus. So for a thousand years after David, they were waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. But God, God, God keeps it, keeps his promises in, in his in his time. That was the, that was the right time. So, all right, that's good. I think uh, I think we should yeah. end things there and uh, a very merry christmas yes the next time you hear from us it will be christmas so uh it'll be, you know it will be the octave of christmas so we we will be able to relate to you all the 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 fun of christmas we hope you have a, a merry and beautiful christmas with your family and uh we'd love to hear from you what what are you doing for christmas especially this year what what's it like for you this year uh let us know so um and let us know what you think of anything other things we talked about let us know about your favorite class one two and three Christmas, Christmas movies. movies and whether you think I'm right and or Melanie's wrong about Polly and Ivy being a two-hour movie. Do <laughs> <laughs> you like how I did that? So you can comment on the show at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B-E-T-T-S or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media or send an email to bets at sqpn.com and like I said, I'll put relevant links from our discussion in our show notes at sqpn.com. Remember to like Raising the Bets on the StarQuest Facebook page. Retweet, retweet us on Twitter. It's hard to say. At SQPN. And leave us comments. So until next time, I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. 